Welcome, welcome, welcome to the webinar. My name is Andrew Jones. I am the executive director of Climate Interactive, and I hope you're here for the webinar using En-ROADS to explore the IRA new climate bill that just passed the Senate here in the US. I'm here with Ellie Johnston and Clara Iglesias and Yasmin Zahar and Crystal Noiser at MIT. And we're excited to have you here. While you get settled and we welcome everybody, would you please open up another browser window? We're gonna be using Poll Everywhere. You can see at the top an address, pollev.com. Go to that place and click on this map. We're always curious to be where everybody is from. This morning had 195 people. You can imagine a little more shifted towards the right side of this global map. Today, perhaps more towards the left. It was 7 a.m. Eastern, yes, this morning when we did this the first time. And here come folks in New England and the Midwest and Texas and the South, a little closer to us and the West. Great seeing you. All right, people are doing it. You can see folks dropping their pins. Someone in Europe. Someone in Brazil, Hawaii, all right, Canada. Welcome. If you're just joining us, please open up another browser window and go to pollev.com, climate inter. You see the pat, the address at the top. We're curious where you are. We're also going to be using this polling software a good bit. My name is Andrew Jones. I'm the co-founder, executive director of Climate Interactive. I'm here with our team of Clara Iglesias and Ellie Johnston and Yasmin Zahar and Crystal Noiser from over at MIT. We're gonna be digging into a systems thinking view of the new IRA bill. Boy, all these people in the US, we're seeing in Mexico and Canada, about five or so clicking in from Europe and we're seeing your pins. Um, happy to see you all joining us. We'll get going in a minute or two after we get a few more people arriving. Of course, the reason we're here is to explore the system-wide implications of this bill that just passed the Senate. We hope it's going to pass the House this week, the IRA bill, long awaited. Well, we see, oh, we have some folks coming from way out in Asia, maybe Indonesia, Thailand. Ellie, how's your geography? You always help me. You beat me on that geography quiz we did back at the Collider once. Uh, I see Thailand. Yeah, Thailand, perhaps Indonesia, uh, Brazil, a couple people out there in Hawaii. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome. Great to have you here. Okay, we are Climate Interactive. We are a not for profit think tank based here in the United States. We partner closely with and grew out of. MIT Sloan School of Management Sustainability Initiative. Here are some of our Twitter handles if you're interested in uh, sharing any of the images or what you're seeing here. What we're going to be doing is digging into thinking about the IRA bill using our simulator En-ROADS, a global simulator. We're going to talk about the results from some national models whose purposes is to calculate what is the greenhouse gas impact of that this bill. We have a different job here. It's a little more on a systems thinking angle. And I thought that uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, the Senator from Rhode Island, who just voted yes this weekend to passing this bill, whom we shared en roads with several times. He's a guy who gave a speech on the Congress floor like every week for the last, I don't know, eight years. He said, engaging with en roads simulation has been one of the best ways for me as a policymaker and notice the words he's using to learn about solutions to tackle climate change, how they can reinforce or interfere with one another. So he's emphasizing the systems thinking component and aspect. That's what we're going to be looking at. How do these actions change this system? And just the highest level summary, of course, is this is aiming to reduce greenhouse gas emissions with a huge boost to clean energy in the United States create jobs and U.S. manufacturing of clean energy and address environmental justice. That's the big framing that Senator Markey 
uses when he describes what's so great about the IRA bill, how we're going to do it today. And by the way, when you have questions along the way, please use Q&A in Zoom. Use the Q&A feature in Zoom, and our team will answer many of your questions that are easy to answer, some of them that are going to send on to our support site. And actually, it might be good just to send a link to everybody to that, the, or uh, Clara, if you would do that. It's uh, got FAQs, and you can tag a ticket for a really complex question about the model. Uh, you can also use chat just to react to what you see going on. And we'll take questions at the end after an hour. So please uh, join them. We're going to be using our En-ROADS simulator. And here's the site for where you can learn to use it. So what I'm doing here with this workshop, you can lead somewhere in the world. In fact, just open it up. And this is the simulator. The beauty of it, what you'll see here, is that you can make a change like energy efficiency in some area and see the results. And you can also run this in 17 different languages. This is this global simulator that we're going to be using to explore the bill. OK. First, we're going to have a brief intro to the bill. We're going to talk about our gratitude about this moment, then concerns, legitimate concerns, because there are some things that I don't think you love and we don't love about the bill. Systems insights, using the simulator next, finishing up with momentum, then we're going to have more of your questions. Now, looking at this map, there are people on this call who have not uh, I probably know much about the bill at all. And they may have just seen a headline. They've never really seen much about En-ROADS. And so I want to just make sure for you all, just you get the basics of what this thing is all about. And so the short version is, this is $369 billion of spending by the US government, again, to address these big three. Reducing emissions, particularly with clean energy and electrification. Secondly, jobs and uh, U.S. manufacturing, and environmental justice. The history going back, this goes all the way back to 2009, Copenhagen Accord, when the U.S. says to the U.N. and the nations of the world, we are going to take action on climate. People came back to D.C., the Senate, and the House said, we're going to create uh, some legislation to take action to actually reduce our emissions here in the United States. It failed. The Waxman-Barkey bill failed. We languished for a while. President Obama was able to do some things with executive action, but did not get his clean power plan that he really wanted. It didn't happen. The Trump years were terrible along the lines here. And really, the modern era that led to this moment of this bill passing, uh, historians are talking about it going back to 2018, Sunrise Movement, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, and sitting in with other activists in Pelosi's office, Nancy Pelosi, uh, prominent congressional leader, sitting in saying, we want more aggressive action. At that time, Greta Thunberg and that whole Fridays for the Future movement, global youth, the Green New Deal movement, really kind of brought in a new level of pressure. Let's take action, said the world. 2019 and the presidential candidate, uh, Jay Inslee said, we're going to spend nine trillion. Remember this number, nine trillion, in this kind of uh, these investments. Senator Sanders said no, sixteen trillion dollars. Neither of them won the election. We got Biden. Biden then proposed about a year and a half ago two trillion dollars of spending. Um, it's taken this last year and a half of negotiating and back and forth. We thought the bill was dead three weeks ago. It came back eventually with concessions to the fossil fuel industry that we'll talk about in a minute. And that one, two trillion got trimmed all the way down to basically 0.369. It's basically 20% of what that proposal was, $369 billion. That's where we are today. What does it do? Let's look at some of the analysis from some of these great analytic teams out of Princeton with the repeat model. I love this graph. It goes all the way back to 1950, excuse me. And it shows investment in energy capacity. You see this 
black area, that's coal and natural gas. And then 50s and the 60s, a little bit of nuclear. Here's the boom of fracking in the US, 2000, a boost in natural gas. Come to the present, the recent amazing growth in wind and solar is this blue and yellow area leading up to today. Now I'm gonna look forward to the right here. You see all that yellow? You see how incredibly tall those yellow bars are? I'm gonna focus in now on them. Going into the future, this is the what's expected by this Princeton modeling team for solar, for onshore wind, for offshore wind, et cetera. A huge surge in clean energy by extending the tax breaks for wind, solar, renewables, some for nuclear. So this is what we expect to see. What does it get us? There are three fantastic modeling groups that have national models. Our model is a global model, and these are national models. The rhodium group shows you here the emissions from the US, which has been falling, expected to drop 40, 31 to 44% below 2005 levels by 2030. President Biden said we our goal is to get to 50%, so it's 80% of the way there. Energy innovation is another group, similar around 40%. And that Princeton group I showed you earlier, around 40%. So they all agree about the scale of what this could actually bring us with the first goal, which is mitigation, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The second goal is jobs. Biden says, when I think climate, I think jobs. Energy innovation says that this will bring 1.5-ish million new jobs, 1% increase to the GDP, they say. The third is environmental justice. The, uh, this group uh, calculated, this is energy innovation again, how many avoided premature deaths we're going to see by 2030 under a variety of scenarios. And it's not just that Fewer people are dying. This is mostly due to air quality. We'll explore the dynamics of this later. But in particular, bringing those benefits to these groups, not just to groups of white people, but Black, Asian, and other race or multiple races, because these groups of people have been disproportionately affected over time by the siting of coal-fired power plants in particular near their neighborhoods and leading to all sorts of diseases and premature deaths. So significant drops, what is that? 14%, 22%, oh wait, 0.22% drop in those deaths. So three big goals that it's trying to address. So what I wanna do is I've been hollering some numbers at you. I wanna just take a moment to just slow down and have some gratitude for where we are. Now note, we're gonna talk in a minute about things that we're concerned about. So don't know, know that we will go there, but still, we don't get a lot of good news here in the climate field. So for what or for whom are you feeling gratitude now at this moment regarding this news? Please open up another browser, polev.com, we want to hear Jay Inslee, the presidential candidate who said we should spend $9 trillion back then when that just seemed insane. Your niece's future, gratitude for your niece's future, for the whole Democratic Party finally got it together to figure this out. Citizen Climate Lobby, all of those hundreds and hundreds of meetings with senators saying we need more aggressive action on climate. The Sunrise Movement, the activists, other student groups, powerful activist groups, the Senate actually passed something. Good job, Senate. Al Gore, going back 2007, inconvenient truth. The pressure so many years ago, 15 years ago, grateful to the Republicans who came around and to the Republicans who voted. Uh, President Biden, President Biden, good job, Biden, climate and social activist. Chuck Schumer, who helped fashion this deal with Joe Manchin, finally to finish it. Youth groups that perfection did not get in the way of progress. The stamina of Chuck Schumer in dealing with Manchin, even when we thought that Manchin had shut the whole deal down. My activist community, you're feeling gratitude. Your granddaughters, White House. I assume that's Sheldon White House who made that speech every week 
on the Congress floor to keep the pressure on. Maybe Manchin, question mark. This is the Democratic senator who was the holdout for so long. Citizen Climate Lobby. Yes, another activist group working together to have an impact to all the environmental activists all around the globe, all the people outside of the US putting pressure for us to take action. Grownups acting like grownups. Dr. Brosnan, a climate scientist, the guts of the Senate. Oh, this is wonderful. All activists who pulled all the levers of political will. Citizen Climate Lobby, again, a great group that uses En-ROADS, many of them. I'm grateful that something is finally being done on a larger scale. Thank you, thank you. Okay, enough of this good feeling. Let's take a step back and talk about this. And we're gonna get to the benefits and what we love about it, but here's the next question. What are you concerned about? The fact that it does, and we'll get into it more later, support fossil fuel production in the negotiations that was achieved by the fossil fuel industry and by the Joe Mansions who are funded by them. Too weak on environmental justice, question mark. It's not enough. There's no carbon price. Maybe it's too expensive. Maybe there's too much money for distracting lower priority solutions or other. Please write in chat if there's something else that came to mind. Um, something else that came to mind. Okay, so you're voting and voting. This is great. Uh, it's neck and neck. It's not enough and no carbon price. It's not enough and no carbon price. It's not enough, no carbon price. All right, well, those two, Let's explore those two first. It's not enough and there's no carbon price. And then we're gonna come over to fossil fuel production because I know uh, my colleague Crystal has some information on what it actually does for fossil fuel production. So it's not enough, no carbon price. Let's, um, let's go over to En-ROADS and explore it. So we're gonna explore this in global En-ROADS. And so the question here is not, don't look at the temperature right now, but instead we're gonna focus on how these sorts of things that are funded affect the overall climate system, the energy system, the land system, and notice what it does and when it does it. And we'll compare that with what, we, what you get with the carbon price. And so some of the things that are being funded, we're gonna test against this baseline. And Get you all grounded, and here's the baseline. This is where we get the energy in this low action future. And by the way, in light of this bill and some other things, we're probably going to be uh, producing a new baseline. We're increasingly confident we're not going to see quite as much coal in the future. But for now, a no low action 3.6 degree future that we don't want to see is caused by the brown area from 2000 to 2100, coal on top of it, oil on top of it, natural gas. There is the expanding wedge of wind and solar. We're expecting a lot of wind and solar in the future. Uh, bioenergy and then nuclear on top. If that's where we get our energy and we add in methane and fluorinated gases and nitrous oxide from fertilizer, then we get this curve on the right greenhouse gas net emissions from 2000 to 2100. It is the pollution that causes climate change. There's a little blip there for the COVID blip that we're in right now. It's expected to pick back up again, heading to 3.6. So let's add in some of the things that were uh, the most funded and see, is it not enough or why it's not enough? And in particular, in light of how soon we need to reduce emissions. Here, the red dot is all the pledges to the, net, the NDCs. We know that even following the national determined contributions, which are the pledges to the Paris Agreement to the United Nations, if the blue line could go through there, it wouldn't be enough. We need to do better than that. The science says we need a 50% drop by 2030 in greenhouse gas emissions. So let's look at the kinds of things that were funded. And it's fantastic that we got 
funding to renewables. So more renewables. I'm going to subsidize renewables. And you watch the green area expand. And we're able to add to that some of what's been proposed with electrification of transport. These two things work particularly well together. Electrification sends demand over to the electricity world. Renewable energy can provide it, in this case, wind and solar. The other things that have been funded, extensive funding, buildings and industry, particularly in lower income communities, which slowly and steadily slows down overall energy consumption. Look at that big contribution. If we were to see steady investment in energy efficiency, in buildings and HVAC systems and motors and appliances, all of these kinds of systems, but it takes a while. That's the thing I want you to notice here is how the clean energy approach disrupts coal, oil, and gas, but slowly. Go, I'm going to show you a little, going to go back to this other graph before. We'll see how it kicks in over time. There also is some support to more efficiency in transport and overall electrification, such as um, heat pumps and electrification of buildings and industry. Now, note. Again, global model, not in the US. This is really basically simulating if the whole world took this sort of approach. But I want you to notice what it's doing in this system. The reason that greenhouse gas emissions are going down is because of all the things it does to reduce coal, see that? To deuce, reduce oil, significant cuts in oil, and significant cuts in gas. However, notice the timing it takes a long time for coal, oil, and gas infrastructure, last 30 years on average. It takes a long time for it to retire away and for this new clean energy to come in, which is zero carbon or electrified or more efficient. It takes a long time. Cars turn over more quickly, 15 years. But the challenge when it comes to meeting our near-term emissions goals, look at what happens to overall greenhouse gas emissions. It is not bringing those emissions down in the next 10 or 20 years. It's doing a great job in the longer term, but it's not bringing it down. It's quickly to the NDCs. This is what happens when you address the alternatives to fossil fuels. When we complement this, and this is your second concern, what about a carbon price? What about things that keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground in the next 10 or 15 years? This is one of the beauties of carbon pricing or anything that taxes coal, oil, and gas. So watch the very different effect of carbon price. Here, I'm gonna put a high carbon price on and you can see how quickly it kicks in. 22% of emissions around the world are covered by a carbon price now. What if there was more of an approach? You can see why the gas industry and the oil industry, I'm going to pull up oil, why they fought so, so hard, and they really pushed to have anything that directly keeps coal, oil, and gas in the ground in the next 10 or 15 years at a large scale, kept that out of this bill because they don't want to see this. They want to see continued production of oil around the world and gas over this next 10 or 15 years. So the concern is legitimate. A carbon price acts sooner, it acts big, and that combination brings us significant results. Um, the, we saw some math from the repeat lab. They looked it up to see what would happen under this bill. And when it comes to US oil and gas production, this is a graph from 2020 to 2032 for crude oil production and natural gas production, continuing up through the 2030s, starting to level, and there's some uncertainty. That's what the, the gray wedge is. The orange wedge here is the uncertainty when it comes to natural gas rising and leveling. This is, of course, is at a time when we know we need oil and gas production to fall radically, ideally 50% by 2030. And uh, well, we, and yet this is what 
is likely to be coming going into the future. So this is a significant challenge and really one of our major concerns. When are we gonna have the power not only to promote clean energy, but to more aggressively keep us from burning coal, oil, and gas that brings such big results when it comes to uh, climate mitigation. Okay, so there are the first two. And to add even more, Crystal, let's talk about this other concern, which is your concern number three. I'm going back here and we're going to look at it. Um, we talked about it's not enough, not addressing coal, oil, and gas. No carbon price, we can see what that would have done. Support for fossil fuel production. Crystal, what exactly is in there when it comes to support for fossil fuel production? Sure, so I think the biggest thing that people seem to be concerned about is that for the next 10 years, it prevents the Department of the Interior from offering um, land leases for renewable development without also offering similar leases for oil and gas. So they have to offer 2 million acres in federal lands onshore, 60 million acres offshore to the fossil fuel industry within a year's time, or they can't hold the land leases for renewable development. This is a step worse than what I was just talking about. And the, this is the big challenge, is that it's not just saying we're only gonna promote alternatives to fossil fuels in clean energy, but we are also going to have a all of the above approach where if we have more clean energy, we're also gonna have more fossil fuels. Now, the good news on this, Energy Innovation did the math and they said, all the clean energy, how many tons of greenhouse gas emissions are avoided? Call it 24. Then they said, what about all that gets encouraged in fossil fuels? One. So it's a 24 to one ratio of encouraging emissions reduction from, fossil, from uh, clean energy versus increasing emissions through fossil fuels. The scale is quite different. And yet the truth remains, all we were able to get through is a deal where we still, in order to keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground, which the industry doesn't want, we're going to encourage coal, oil, and gas and push those up a little bit. And this kind of trade is a dangerous precedent because the reason we want clean energy is to avoid burning coal, oil, and gas, the primary causes of climate change. So thank you. Let's look at any others that we see here. Um, I'm gonna jump straight to other things to explore and let's take environmental justice first because I think we're gonna be quite, well, there are some really encouraging things there. So let's ask the next question. Um, you heard what I think, I wanna go, I want you to vote A, but, uh, <laughs> What are the other things? Please go to poll everywhere. And uh, which of these are you most interested in exploring? You can vote for two, really wanna see environmental justice, the methane price, what it has for adaptation and resilience. What if the whole world took this approach? Jobs and just transition, clean energy electrification and energy efficiency. Uh, Crystal, it looks like you're gonna get queued up Talk, tell us about environmental justice. Uh, environmental justice is getting the top vote. Uh, what do you see there? There's quite a bit in here. Um, one of the major things is $3 billion in grants for uh, environmental justice community block grants is what they call them. And they fund community-led air and other pollution monitoring, prevention, and mitigation. This could have um, effects on mitigating health risks from extreme heat, from the urban heat island effect, uh, reducing indoor pollution. There's also funding for facilitating better engagement with disadvantaged communities around these state and federal um, public processes. Fantastic. Um, and when we look at why we're seeing all of these benefits, uh, we'll look at En-ROADS in a minute, but I know like some of the numbers that came out of energy innovation uh, Energy Innovation thinks there are going to be 3,900 avoided premature deaths, 100,000 asthma attacks avoided, 417,000 lost workdays concentrated in communities of color. 
to use En-ROADS to explore some of these things, what you can do is go look at some of these scenarios and see why it's happening in the world. So I'm going to actually, maybe I'll just grab this scenario that I shared for the difference between the supply and the demand approaches. I'm copying the scenario link. New users of En-ROAD, new users of En-ROADS, maybe you didn't know it, but you can just click here, copy a link. I'm gonna go to chat and I'm going here to chat and I'm gonna drop it in and you can go see this scenario and go try it yourself. But I'm undoing this and just focus on some of the things we just saw of energy efficiency, a lot of electrification, a lot of buildings in industry, a little less of energy efficiency and transport, a little less electrification of buildings and industry. There's a little nuclear here, maybe more renewables. So when we look at this sort of scenario, we go to some of the impacts and the one that really is causing those benefits that you just heard, asthma attacks, lost workdays, fewer premature deaths, it is due to this, pre PM 2.5 emissions. This is the small particles emitted mostly from burning coal that is implicated one in 10 deaths around the world. Think of poor visibility in New Delhi, in Beijing, in, well, my hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, particularly when I was growing up, you couldn't see very far because of PM 2.5 emissions. Notice how much this is going down and how soon. And with a carbon price, even sooner and bigger because it is so tough on coal. Coal drops, this drops, you can see the sources of it going to this graph, air pollution of energy by source. And you can see that it really is about the coal, this brown area of coal falling, a little bit of bioenergy where we're no longer built, burning as many trees for energy, a little bit of oil in red, but it's mostly about coal. This is the source of that co-benefit that we're really excited to see. All right, those are some of the uh, environmental justice benefits. Um, back to other things that you're interested in. Here we were. Um, environmental justice got the top vote. Then it was the methane price. Methane price. Uh, Crystal, can you explain what the methane price is? Sure. So in the bill, it first and foremost actually establishes a methane emissions reduction program. So that's more to add incentives and funding for better methane mitigation and monitoring. But then it goes ahead and adds a price of $900 a ton starting in 2024 and then going up to $1,500 a ton in 2026. So uh, facilities that comply with EPA regulations would be exempt from that price. And there is concern that people have about, um, you know, the traditional self-reporting and under-reporting of these things. So there is a concern there that they can get around the price. Got it. Well, when you think about it, two points on this, one of them is just the incredible power of methane. And fingers crossed, we're going to be able to improve this sector radically because right now it's so simplified. You can see under here. We basically get to move all of these short-lived forcers as one or break them into agriculture and waste emissions, energy and industry emissions. They matter a lot. If we have a significant cut in them, notice all the benefit, 0.4 degrees, 0.5 degrees. The Global Methane Pledge is trying to get emissions to fall even faster way down here and steeper, this could be a big deal. Methane and other emissions matter. But what's exciting in my mind is the precedent of pricing a greenhouse gas. Chris Knittel, professor at MIT, calculated that that price of $900 per ton of methane is about $60 per ton CO2e. And so it could be the open door to something I've been emphasizing, the power of carbon pricing. Methane pricing seems to be working its way into the way that we think about uh, addressing climate here in the United States. Perhaps this could set a precedent 
and we could have other kinds of pricing. So there's the methane price. The next one you were asking about, um, there's money for adaptation and resilience. Uh, what do you see there? I think coastal communities, uh, go ahead, Crystal, what do you see there? Oh, my mute. Oh. Um, yeah, so coastal community resilience, there's $6 billion for NOAA, so that's the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration in the U.S., and that enables them to provide funding, uh, grants, cooperative agreements, technical assistance, et cetera, to communities that are um, faced with, with coastal stresses from climate change. So good to see this. This is on the adaptation side, and when you engage people with En-ROADS, you get to help them realize that um, and you know look at areas you could pull up a graph a map of Miami Beach for example and then have them see with action things get better for these areas but we still need even under emissions reduction scenarios like these where we get below two degrees I'm gonna quickly make a scenario uh, to get under two degrees. Um, that even under these scenarios, there are blue areas. Blue areas on this map mean that uh, they are still land at risk in even in a 1.7 degree scenario. Green areas, in this case, were are much better off because they're not at risk because we've avoided some warming. So I'll go back. Well, and when you, um, you can go all the way back to so the green areas, more at risk, the blue areas still at risk. And um, I'll undo this and you can go all the way back and see under a worst case scenario, all of these areas are at risk. So money to NOAA to protect coastal communities, badly needed. It's really good that this is in the works. All right, I'm gonna go back over and see what else did we, did you all vote for and want to explore? So adaptation and resilience, jobs and just transition. Crystal, what's in there for jobs and just transition? Yeah, so under the renewable energy tax credits, there's an increase in a credit for facilities that are uh, providing apprenticeship programs and good wages. So it will increase the tax credit by a factor of five. There's also, um, in terms of U.S. jobs, there's a 10% bonus in the production tax credit if 40% or more of the steel, iron, um, and components of a facility were produced inside the United States. Um, also with that community block grant we talked earlier about with environmental justice, there's funding there for uh, workforce development in those EJ communities. Yeah, and maybe you mentioned this before, but for energy communities, for communities that currently produce uh, coal, oil, and gas and are losing jobs, there is a bonus for those to address just transition. So the thing that you hear all about, oh, but we're going to lose jobs in these communities, this bill addresses that and says, yeah, we want folks to be able to get jobs in these new industries of clean tech. So that's pretty encouraging as well. One note, you may ask, why have we not put jobs in En-ROADS to show you some numbers here? Um, right now, the economics and the modeling of it is not at the stage where we actually can add it. So we haven't been able to, we made a big push and it just didn't come together. Uh, the world of science isn't quite ready to add jobs to this global model. All right, other, what are some other things that people were interested in exploring. What if the whole world took this kind of approach? And Crystal, you and I have been going back and forth on this scenario. What if the whole world took this kind of approach? Again, global model, but let's put in some of the things that we saw here and said, what if the whole world took this kind of approach? So certainly big incentives for renewables, and underneath it, the potential, we, you can't count on a breakthrough, but Drew? if there was- a, share your screen. Excuse me, Drew, yes. Ah, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Got ahead of myself. Okay, here it goes. 
Um, all right. First, renewables. More subsidies to renewables. We cannot count on a breakthrough, but it some of these investments could bring cheaper storage and other things that could lead to even more growth. I'm going to let you see what that actually looks like. It's pretty when you see this renewable energy demand. The black, the blue line, excuse me, the, the black line is a lot. This new line is even more. Complement that with, as I said, significant electrification. Um, in transport, there's also money for air and water electrification. Who knows if that's even technically possible? There could be more in that area. Um, a little bit in energy efficiency, buildings and industry, heat pumps, funding for that. If this approach happens around the world, the electrification of our HVAC systems, energy efficiency, particularly in low income housing around the world. Uh, what does that do to overall energy demand? That would lead energy consumption not to be rising, but actually flatten out over time. We're at 2.9 degrees, still a big gap with the red line. I showed you that 20 minutes ago. These clean energy approaches take a while to kick in. There's some money for nuclear. There's some money for carbon capture and storage. Doesn't work at scale yet. Likely limited in what it can really do. Temperature doesn't drop even a 0.1 when we subsidize it. Same with coal. Coal CCS, current math is showing it not to drop much at all if the existing coal includes carbon capture and storage. You could say that the handouts to the fossil fuel industry says a little more oil. I'm gonna pull up oil. We're gonna look at it and say, there's oil. Well, here's the little bit of a subsidy to them, an extra and a little bit to natural gas. We can go look at natural gas and say a little more natural gas, a boost to natural gas in the near term. Also, Crystal, you said there was some funding around deforestation, probably significantly around methane. Mm -hmm. And Crystal, what did I miss? Um, so there's some for technological carbon removal around direct Thank air you. capture. Thank you. Direct air capture are these machines that use a lot of energy. They're kind of like a dehumidifier, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere, collecting it. You can pipe it, put it underground for storage. We went to the Royal Society study to include how much direct air capture they think might be possible around the world. Uh, it is funded, there are tax breaks for it in this bill in the US. What if it happened around the world? at a large scale. I'm gonna go down here to direct air capture and we're gonna watch, we're gonna watch as you see how much removal it actually brings. Over here, you can see, here is all the emissions going into the atmosphere, land use CO2, energy CO2, those F gases, methane, nitrous oxide. We're gonna watch as we have negative emissions. Here, I'm going to put up towards what? 84% of the potential. And so what you're going to see is this jump up to 2.3 gigatons a year, which is what that study thought would be a potential. There's huge potential for more if it could grow. We don't know yet. I'm going to run it again. You can see the scale of a little silver area under the zero line. That is how much get is getting removed. You can see why it's such a modest contribution. Put it all together and you get here 2.5-ish degrees. The point though is less the temperature. And I want you to understand some of the key dynamics. If the whole world took this approach, it would take a while for greenhouse gas emissions to fall. It would take a while. Why? Primarily because it doesn't stop burning coal, oil, and gas significantly in the next 10 or 15 years for the reasons I laid out earlier. Oil continues to grow until 2030 and then peaks. Natural gas, 
grows until 2030s or so, then starts to fall. Coal probably a little, well, not as much sooner. Boy, let's hope that gets down sooner for all sorts of reasons. So one of these challenges is the delayed impact if the world took this kind of approach, the delayed impact on addressing the fossil fuel industry. I made my speech on that earlier. Anything else that you saw here that I missed, Crystal, with this scenario? Uh, one other thing, and I, I'm not even sure we got to it this morning when we did this, but there is, and this goes to the uh, concern about some of the lower leverage solutions, there's also funding in there to promote uh, different forms of biofuels and bioenergy. Ah, well said, well said. And we're right now adding that to En-ROADS and really confirming how little an investment in bioenergy actually helps the climate. So you'll notice no real change here if there's a boost to bioenergy, which is burning trees for energy, biofuels, so there are other sources from crops, of course, that you can have for, for energy. Very little um, contribution here. Well, 2.6. Actually, did it go up? Oh, it went up. It went up because of all of the impact of burning all these trees, which is increasing overall temperature. So here we are at 2.6. I'm gonna take this scenario for anybody curious, just gonna drop it into overall into the chat. And I wanna pull back to, take a step back to a kind of a bigger picture view on what this is really bringing. And back over here, uh, I really want to talk about momentum. There's a really great podcast I heard, and Clara, you found it, I think. Leah Stokes, a professor, Dr. Leah Stokes, convened a conversation. I want to get my notes here with Representative Pramila Jayapal, who's in the House of Representatives, Reverend Yenick Lennox Yearwood Jr., and uh, Senator Ed Markey, who is the Markey of Waxman Markey bill from 10 years ago. And when they talked about what they particularly appreciated about the IRA bill, they talked about momentum. And they talked about it in two ways that were really systems thinking principles that just seem so beautiful and really captured my excitement for this moment and why I'm going to have tears of joy when hopefully this week the House of Representatives passes this bill and it goes to President Biden to be signed and it comes into place because it is such an important step forward, particularly when it comes to momentum. And the idea is a reinforcing loop. So I'd like you to think about a virtuous cycle, a reinforcing feedback loop that behaves like a snowball on a hill, that the more you have, the more you get, something that grows in a, like a snowball rolling down a hill. There are two of them, actually three loops. The first one is built into En-ROADS and they talked about this on uh, Dr. Stokes's podcast, falling renewable energy. So this boost and subsidies to renewables brings down renewable costs, pushes up renewables production. The more that we produce, the more these companies are push, pushing out more panels, the more we do it all around the world, but in this case in the US, that builds experience and that production experience, we get better and better at producing them more cheaply, better supply lines, better materials, fewer negative side effects to the materials that are needed. Field experience, we know business models for installing them in cities, in rural areas, at commercial scale, public acceptance, people believe that they actually work, research and development into new approaches. And then this feeds back, more experience brings down the cost even more into a reinforcing feedback loop. That's why there's an R in the middle that we call economies of scale. The more you do, the cheaper it gets. Now in En-ROADS, it's really transparent. We built this in mathematically. There's an important factor, which is the learning rate or progress ratio. 
And the idea is every doubling of cumulative experience of wind and solar brings the cost down 20%. And that is explicitly here in the model. And if you want to go take the course on En-ROADS, you will go learn about it and you can display it to other people. I'm going to get rid of this past scenario um, that I just showed. Uh, and here it comes. I'm going to look at uh, final energy consumption and renewable energy. I have it where the y-axis is very tall here. And so you can see it's only growing modestly because the y-axis is so tall. But let's open up assumptions. And like many uh, variables in the model, you can explicitly see here is renewables. You can see the progress ratio. Like I just said, how much costs fall due to learning experience and economies of scale. And what's our source, Jungier et al., McDonald et al., these are the two sources for it. It is 0.8. 1 minus 0.8 is 0.2. That is the 20% drop in cost with every doubling of cumulative capacity. What if we learn faster and learn better? What is that re reinforcing loop going to do? Oh, yeah, it's going to grow faster, particularly over this next 20 year years or so, if it's 30%. This is the momentum loop at work keeping coal from being burned, gas from being burned, bringing emissions down. This is the momentum. So when we subsidize this industry, we are pushing that snowball a little harder from the top of that hill. And it, then it goes coursing down, bringing the cost down more, leading to more and more growth. Fantastic this momentum. You and we are part of this right now. Feel that growing momentum and energy regarding the boom of the clean energy movement. A couple more that they mentioned actually in this podcast. Witnessing success. There's nothing like it right now in this country and around the world. Action, all of those activists, all of those scientists, you guys writing letters, voting, talking to others, writing papers, writing op-eds, encouraging activists, supporting them, all the things that have been happening, going to marches, et cetera. We are seeing results. We have laws being passed. When we see those results, we say, and I hope you're saying to yourself this week, we can do this. We have the power we have the capacity, we have pulled it together enough to actually do things that make a difference in the world. That builds our confidence that I hope with you is saying we need more action because as we laid out, there's so much more to do. This is a reinforcing loop that I hope you can capture, enjoy, and ride because it is so critical right now. We needed a win really badly, you guys, and I think we really got one. What does it do internationally? There are people from around the world here. I've been to many of these UN negotiations and I've heard the arguments that my friends around the world run into. Why would we act with the US not acting? Why would we act here in China, India, Indonesia, Brazil, South Africa, Mexico, when the largest emitter in history the United States of America, the biggest producer of oil on earth, the biggest producer of gas on earth is not even doing anything itself. It's an understandable argument, but guess what? That has shifted. US action leads to other country climate action. I believe that this is contagious. This is spreading around the world, of course, we're not that big a deal. We're only 15% of emissions here in the United States, but I really hope this weakens that argument that the US is not in. I'm really excited to go to Sharm El Sheikh, Egypt for the next COP to feel a little bit of that boost that the US is all in. These loops are active. So overall, with those loops, the reinforcing loops around uh, renewable energy, this confidence building loop this international action, we are now riding a wave. 
So it's going to be critical for all of us to find what we can do to contribute at this critical moment, to take this time, not just celebrate, but to carry it forward into the future. So I'll ask you, here we are. How are you feeling about this? How are you feeling? Write one word, several hyphenated words. If you have two words, put a hyphen between them and so that it looks like one word, it'll help it better on this diagram. Empowered. Somebody is feeling hopeful, optimistic, anxious, not frustrated anymore, guardedly optimistic, optimistically, fired up, encouraged, not frustrated, cautiously optimistic, tentatively hopeful, <laughs> uh, guardedly optimistic, <laughs> somewhat dis hopeful, optimistic, fired up. Uh, let's do this. Tears of joy, tears of joy, ambivalent. Let's do this. Good about the power of diffusion. Optimistic must ensure happens. Hopeful, not despondent. Oh, these are wonderful. Now, if you write what other people did, they get bigger. <laughs> but uh, these are fantastic. Oh, it just got a lot smaller. Uh, some people furious that, wow, there's a really long one there that I missed. Uh, hopeful and recommitted to action. Furious that merchant powers did something. Uh, optimistic must ensure happens. Wonderful. Happy to read this. Okay. There's a feeling and then there's action. Be part of this loop. What does this call you to do? What does this call you to do? What are you going to do next? Vote. Boy, we are seeing the power of that here in the United States. Stacey Abrams, big leader in Georgia, really helped us get out the vote in Georgia that got the Senate to 50 Democrats. Without that, this never would have happened. Work harder on policy, get a climate job, organize, wonderful. Continue to do environmental education in schools. Keep working with the citizen climate lobby. You guys are fantastic. Keep it up. Let us know what you're up to next. Educate. Educate. Get voter turnout. Absolutely. So critical. Advocate. These are wonderful actions that you're talking about. Organize. Collective power will be the way that we will move forward. Continue training community groups and your students. Work towards a carbon price. You saw the power of it a minute ago. The Environmental Voter Project. Fantastic. Work on elections. Work on elections. Vote. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right. We love to end our things on time. So just to wrap this up, we have a powerful new bill that just got through the Senate. It's going to the House. We expect it to be signed into law soon. Big three focuses, climate mitigation through clean energy, jobs, environmental justice. It does so much. Our biggest concern, pushing off the confronting of keeping coal, oil, and gas in the ground by confronting that power in the world. This brings us so, so much. 40% drop in emissions from 2005. We want 50, but it brings so much, in particular, so much momentum in clean energy, in our confidence to take more action, in our leadership or stop, no longer being a stop, a stopper to action around the world. There are many things that you would love about this. You've described how you're feeling and what you might do. Overall, friends, it's not going to be easy to follow through on this momentum. It's going to be worth it. Go get them. Goodbye. And do stick around if you have questions. We'll be here. We really want to answer more of your questions that we didn't get to in the Q&A. All right. Bye-bye, many of you. But do stick around if you'd like to. Oh, people are writing nice things in the chat. You're welcome, everybody. 
you are welcome. Oh, and I should share, uh, we love Twitter. And please do post. Oh, I'm going to hold on a sec. I got to share my screen. Um, if you took any screenshots or have any reflections, put it on Twitter, put it out into the world and tell them about this. And also, maybe Clara, would you post again the, the training, the Mastering En-ROADS course? You can learn how to run workshops with En-ROADS. There are 60, I think 60, five to 10 minute videos, 30 quizzes, meetups of this group. There are 525 or 30 people around the world who are running workshops with this. So join this amazing group of people. And uh, we're hoping to grow the number of workshops that are being run and the demand for them. People are writing lovely things in chat, saying that we're making a difference, et cetera. Will we send you a recording of the webinar, Kay? Yes. Uh, Clara, when do people receive that? How does that work? We'll send a follow-up email tomorrow. You, you will all receive a recording uh, tomorrow. Great, great. So I think we're shifting to the Q and A. Wait, did I see someone? Kat from Cleveland, Ohio. Yes. Cleveland is a great place to uh, be from when you work on climate because we dealt with hardship and a bad reputation uh, for so long. People always think we're gonna lose because of our sports teams, but we hang in there no matter what, we're persistent. Okay. Uh, Clara, Crystal, Ellie, are there any that you would elevate that, um, that you would like addressed or that you have an answer to that you wanna give? There are so many questions, it's hard to think. <laughs> I know <laughs> but... we have 250 people, my gosh. Yes. Someone asked if you could re uh, explain again quickly that 24 to one ratio you talked about in the beginning about the concerns with fossil fuels. Yeah. So go energy innovation, go to their Twitter feed or go to their reports for this. My understanding of it is they calculated the uh, IRA in the United States, they add up how much avoided greenhouse gas emissions, how many tons of avoided gas greenhouse gas emissions through 2030, this much. Then they said, oh, these provisions for the MVP pipeline, for Gulf of Mexico drilling, Alaska coastal drilling, that would increase emissions this much. This is 24 times bigger than this. 24 times more greenhouse gas avoided than additionally emitted through the bill. We didn't talk about solar and tax, EV tax subsidies. There is momentum there. So we talked about, so. oh, you're tied to an answer. Uh, EV, we didn't talk about the, the, the EV. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely, and the reinforcing loops there. I mean, I almost did this interactively. Like, could you all name all of the reinforcing loops? There's <laughs> so many. I mean, the ones with electric vehicles, like I can't go to my airport uh, with my electric vehicle because there aren't enough charging stations. There will be charging stations. That is part of this reinforcing loop. More electric vehicles, more opportunity for people to make money by putting in charging stations. Therefore, the ease of using an EV, more EVs, so many more reinforcing loops. Um, LA Times has an article about the difficulty of implementing large solar systems, <laughs> solar systems, uh, mm -hmm. photovoltaic systems due to land requirement. What do you think, naysayers or accurate? Uh, we ought to add that. So. Clara, can you just note that? We ought to at least put that in GitHub. We have a wish list of things that we really want to add. We had it in a version about eight years ago. How much land is required? My intuition 
is that we have the land. It's not so much that it would be a limit, but uh, intuition, as you know, isn't worth that much. Does the 15% include outsourced emissions to other countries? So Michael, I think is referring to the fact that the United States emissions is about 15% of global. So no, 15% is direct emissions. Roy, the US is not all in. Only 50% plus Kamala Harris voted for this action. Yes, you're right. We are not all in. We have a law. This is where adrenaline, it probably happened. Oh my gosh. You could note so many times when adrenaline leads me to overstate things. We are not all in. Relative to when I was in Marrakesh, when the day that we learned that Trump was elected at the UN negotiations and everybody said the US is out, we are much more in with this IRA bill. Will there be a new baseline that assumes IRA, John Glover? The, the, the short answer is yes. We will not be calculating exactly the IRA because again, it affects 15% of emissions. But we're taking a good look. And the latest news is more about the, not the IRA, but the IEA, the International Energy Agency has some new scenarios and they're showing and forecasting less coal. So we are anticipating that. And we're also noting actions by many countries such as the United States. Can companies use En-ROAD to build their own company specific scenarios? No, 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 no. You can take principles from global En-ROADs like we did today, principles, but you can't downscale this model to a country, to a state, a province, a community, a company. That's a new model. In system dynamics modeling, the method we use, you have, every model has a purpose. You don't really adapt this model to that kind of setting. But what you can do is think global and act company. And the principles here are really relevant. Did you notice what I was pointing out? When do renewables kick in and really help? What is the difference between a clean energy approach and the delays versus directly keeping fossil fuels in the ground and those kind of impacts? What are the reinforcing loops regarding economies of scale? These are systems insights revealed by a system dynamics model. Use it that way. How about the impact of mangroves and oyster reefs? Do you have a slider? We're wondering if afforestation might be expanded to those areas, but we don't have those yet. Good question, John, thank you. Do you consider project drawdown solutions in our model, says Dana. I don't see a reference. It's another tool that helped me know where to volunteer your efforts. Absolutely. So, um, so it is the best catalog, project drawdown, in all of the things that could lead to those 18 sliders and en roads taking action. You'll notice we particularly focus on the dynamics. We're so interested at how things play out over time. Project Drawdown has these great bubbles and circles that show you the total impact and really just has you thinking so much more broadly about all of the possibilities. They're fantastic. Use them to complement what you do with En-ROADS. Crystal, my friend Crystal, can you let us know who is working on carbon price? Thousands of companies already have a priced, carbon priced internally, although there are different prices. Any discussion of a voluntary agreement on a price? Hi, Crystal. Uh, Citizen Climate Lobby is working hard on it at the government scale. So they're pushing for governments. It's probably changing now with this bill, but um, the way that companies use it, I don't know who is particularly smart on that. So um, I'm gonna have to pass. I thought the new bill authorized renewed offshore drilling in Alaska. Yes, yes. Gulf of Mexico, coast of Alaska, the MVP pipeline, bad news. Uh, can you briefly discuss the impact end rates might show by 30% on solar and wind for 10 years plus EV 7,500 subsidy and heat pumps at 8,000 per 
household, Gabriel. So, uh, sure. So we did it, not this specific scenario, but um, the way that you can use En-ROADS, now uh, I'll, I'll note again, team, this is a great moment. Clara, can I get, uh, you're probably answering a question somewhere. Can you resend the link to the energy innovation model? Um, so to answer this more specifically, go to the energy innovation model for the United States. You probably could connect click those three policies and see what it does. In a systems model, what can you do there? You can uh, simulate those three things. And I'm going to, uh, and so wind and solar, you can subsidize and here, cents per kilowatt hour, one, two, three, four. So what is that doing? That is expanding the green wedge. You could explore how, why does it help? It's keeping coal in the ground, gas in the ground, coal and gas in the ground, more renewables. And you also asked about electric vehicles, which that's gonna really do a lot on oil. I can't do exactly those taxes, of course, but we can explore more and more and more and more electrification over time. And we can also explore electrification of buildings and industry, two things. And so those are other things that will really help and lead to more renewable energy, less greenhouse gas emissions, and good side effects like air pollution from energy going down. All right, other good questions. Um, Others that should get handled with everybody. We need to know about this simulator mechanisms. We need to know. So if it's, you wanna know more about the mechanisms in the simulator and how it works. So to the professor who, who wrote that, um, if that's what you're asking, so, Probably the best source, we shot a whole series of videos and how we build confidence in the model, how we share in our reference guide, all of the equations, how we test the model. And so I think go to learn.climateinteractive.org and there's a whole section on what we call confidence building. That's where you can learn about, learn about the mechanisms in this simulator. I work with Canada, from Canada with an Egyptian university, surprising the great efforts from the Egyptian side and how they're contributing to the climate change attribution. What do you think? How they are contributing to the climate change attribution. Uh, Mr. Nassar, can you say, write that again, if you would, and I'd love to read it, um, what you mean by the attribution, because I'd like to answer your question, but I'm not getting getting uh, quite understanding to answer well yet. Um, and other good questions. I see. Wow, so many good questions and so much in chat. Oh, I'm looking mostly at the chat. Um, it looks like the cost of energy almost doubles by 2030. How does the bill address this? How would you address it? I wanna check that. Um, one of the things that this bill I thought was particularly effective at was to avoid the boost to, let's do like modest renewables at an overall, yeah. So many of the actions that have been proposed reduce overall cost of energy. 
more renewables. They're so cheap it's getting and getting cheaper. It's bringing down the cost. Oh, sorry. But bringing down the overall cost of energy. Um, excuse me a second. I'm going to get a new version of the, of the simulator. So uh, the question is about, it just looks a little weird right now. Pardon me. I'm going to. Okay. So cost of energy, renewables, energy efficiency, electrification tend to bring down the cost of energy. Now, I was singing the praises climate wise of things that more directly keep coal, oil, and gas in the ground. Go back and try those approaches. This is the challenge. Carbon price increases the cost of energy. There are many ideas of how to rebate the revenue that costs, comes from a carbon price back to people. However, still, things that restrict the supply of energy increase the cost of energy. This is one of the reasons that it doesn't get passed. This has been a big problem in California because that money, when you restrict energy, prices go up and that money goes back to the fossil fuel companies who then can use it to fight climate action and other things. So that's what um, the challenge is. That's one of the big challenges. But I think that's maybe what you saw when I was showing some of these scenarios that get really low, have a big problem with the cost of energy. Okay, other questions that are coming up in the Q and A. Oh, you were looking at the version I sent out. Yes, you're welcome, Nathaniel. Okay, can you go over rhodium graph about impact on RA of meeting targets, Polly? No, we are not experts in their model, but let's go look at it again. Um, why, why spread in outcome is the question. Here it is. So current policy is this blue range, you know, of, so one note, just with the current policies, the spread in outcome is we don't know how much wind is going to grow. Right now, coal is coming down. Is it going to fall a lot or a little? Um, that are the kinds of things that affect this range of scenarios. How much is the economy going to grow? Energy demand going to grow? In the same way, the Inflation Reduction Act, 31 to 44 percent. So that is just going to be probably uncertainty. We don't know things about this next eight years. And they had a high scenario and a low scenario. That's why they don't know exactly what. And as you know, scientists, we love to express uncertainty ranges and not make specific forecasts. Um, are the results of the model compared with, with real results? Good question. Good question. So um, I'll show you a couple things about how we do comparisons. And again, Clara, can you find, can you go to YouTube and make the link to the YouTube channel chapter or section, which is all the confidence building. So you should take our course. Go take the course. It's fantastic. You register for it. But because you guys are still here 19 minutes after the end, you're the best. And if you're the best, you get access to the YouTube channel where we have leaked the videos. And for you, Professor, you've asked this question a bunch of times, just go watch some of these videos in this section of how we do the model confidence building. But you asked about compared to real results. And so here are two things about how we compare against real results. And we like to call this confidence building. Uh, no model, it's not validation. No model is valid. 
all we can do is build our confidence in them, in the model to say that uh, we'd like to learn from it and we feel good enough about it to learn from our experiments that we do in the model. Some of the ways that we can compare against real results is that we start the model in 1990. And we start the model in 1990, we have all the equations in the model, and then we hit go. And a set of high order nonlinear differential equations every 45 days simulate 110 years. Now, what we're doing here is we started in 1990, and the good news is that we have 32 years, 31 years of data of what's actually happened in the system. So we make sure that our model tracks the real data. So the IEA, you see the purple, see that purple line? That is the actual data for the marginal cost of solar electricity. It's coming down, down, down. You've probably heard of, maybe heard of Lazard. Here's the data for what solar electricity costs. We, our yellow line is close to that line. Can I say to you, Professor, look at that. Our model is good. Of course not. This is something that we do to build our confidence. And of course, we have to do it for many other measures. The growth in wind and solar, 1990 to recent. We track the growth of wind and solar, but coal, oil, and gas history, we track pretty well. Greenhouse gas emissions. And if you really want to dig into it, go here. And it opens up our user guide where you can see all of our comparisons to history, oil and natural gas and nuclear, et cetera. So that's one way that we compare to actual results. Now, most results we can't compare to because we are trying to simulate another 78 years. And for that, we have a lot of respect for the suite of integrated assessment models that are out there in the world. And so what we do is we compare against their results. There's a scenario called SSP2, the shared socioeconomic pathways, the middle of the road scenario. These red lines are their baselines for image by PBL in the Netherlands, by IASA in Austria's model message Globium, PNNL is here in the United States, GCAM, all of their scenarios. And then for reduction scenarios, all the way down to ones that get down to 1.5. So we take the inputs as much as we can capture them that they put into their models. We do the same thing into our model and see, do we get similar results? So these lines are our results and we see, okay, if the lines were really far off, that would tell us it's time to go improve your model. So those are two examples. There's videos that I hope, were you able to find those, Clara? Did that work okay in the YouTube? Yeah, so go check out those videos and it shows some of the other tests, extreme conditions tests and others like that. Oh my gosh, I have a call in six minutes. In six minutes. So it's time for you to declare victory on a wonderful time with you all. And um, overall, acknowledge the, how many people? 81 who are still around. Go use En-ROADS, show it to people, not because it's a cool model, but because it prompts really good conversations with other people about what we can do to address climate and equity. Anything else from anyone else on our team, Crystal, Clara? Ellie, Yazzie. All right. Well, overall, um, please join me. Boy, it's so great to have so many quests, so many good uh, team members. Scoop Jones, one of our modelers, other people from our team. Uh, everybody, it, it's been a pleasure and goodbye.